have to accept it, whether we were a Remainer or a Lever. There will be doors that will close, but there will be others that will open. As long as we're uh, ready to adapt, we should, as a nation, find it a lot smoother. Shipley's Brexit divide mirrored the nations, and the clear majority of the 52% here who voted leave are over the age of 65. But don't assume they crave a bygone age. The next At the Shipley Tea Dance, <laughs> right, so what am I doing? for Irene, a sprightly 84-year-old, Brexit is about a dynamic future of more jobs for young people and more control. There. As for Remainers, they're blaming all, all the old people. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel responsible? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've got what you want. Yes. I'm glad that Farage has got what he wanted for all these years, and I mean, people are blaming him, but it, 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 it just, it, like he said, we want this country back. And what of the vanquished in this battle for the country's soul? Will it now be all hands on deck? Nick Allen is a Shipley poet and Remainer, whose work is indignant that Brexit is regressive, backward-looking. Where will we find ourselves, brothers and sisters? Where will we find ourselves? Now that we live in a land that can only dream backwards. Can the divide that exists because of Brexit, can that be bridged now we're leaving? That's a huge question. Um, I would hope so, but I would severely doubt it. There's a lot of damage being done. Maybe reconciliation lies with the young the ones who didn't vote and man Brexit barricades. Months we can at least get some base agreements with Europe about how we're going to trade. At Shipley College, these business students share a pragmatism, belying their teen years. In the end, we're all going to live here. We're all um, going to be in the same environment, so we all have to accept this change and move ahead. I have that belief in myself that I can somehow make it work as well. So if I can make it work, I'm sure any, I'll, I'll have that faith that I can make it work. I think anyone can as well. Do you think the country can come together? Yeah, well, we'll have to. We're about to write a new chapter in a storied history. But as Brexit comes to pass and we move forward, what chance we're all on the same page? Clive Murray with that report. Well, while the celebrations go on in Parliament Square, we've also got pictures, live pictures tonight from Cambridgeshire, where they are holding a candlelit vigil in protest at the uh, imminent departure of the United Kingdom from the EU. Seven minutes and 45 seconds to go. Well, many of you have been sending in your questions asking how our departure from the EU will affect your lives. Rita Chakrabarty is here now with some of the answers. Rita. Sophie, let's start with these. Questions about pet passports, driving in Europe and mobile roaming charges are some of the most asked. And the answers to all of these questions is pretty simple. Nothing changes today. You can still travel with your dog or cat to the EU on a current pet passport and your driving licence is still valid in Europe. What happens after December the 31st depends on how talks between Britain and the EU go this year. Mobile roaming charges also stay the same. Again, they may change after the transition period is over. Although some phone companies have said they won't reintroduce charges even if no deal is reached. And there'll also be no change to any UK students on EU Erasmus study schemes. They'll still be able to continue. Now, here's a question from Martins in Copenhagen. Are duty-free rules changing. Well, at the moment, there's no duty-free on trips between the UK and the EU, and this is an area where it's simply not yet clear whether they will be reintroduced after the transition period is over. That will also depend on any deal agreed. And Martin from London asks us when the new blue passport is coming out. Well, you won't be guaranteed a blue one immediately after we leave because the stock of burgundy passports needs to be used up, so the blue ones will be phased in over a period period of months. Now, if looking at all of this you think nothing much is going to change now, you're right. In a sense, the big decisions which will materially affect us are still to come at the end of the year. Sophie. Rita, thank you. 
Well, let's take you back now to Parliament Square. Nigel Farage is uh, still addressing the crowd. Thousands of people have gathered there in Parliament Square this evening. They've been waiting there for many hours now um, to mark this moment, five minutes to go, when we leave the European Union after 47 years of membership. Well, ever since the UK joined what was then called the European Economic Community in 1973, the relationship has been subject to intense scrutiny. With just a few minutes to go before we leave, let's look back at some of the key moments from the past 47 years. A new and a greater united Europe. Officially, we became members at midnight local time what do you think of the common market? I don't think much of it, well. It's all kidologies and it's a waste of money. I think it's absolutely vital that everyone should turn out in this referendum and vote yes. Let's stay in the common market. Yes or no? You're holding up no. And it's beginning to look as if we may not have a single no counting area. Well, now we make way gracefully for play school. We'll be back with more results at 4.25. Frenchman could have done that. Absolute unbelievable. No. 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 Don't bind my hands when I am negotiating on behalf of the British nation. Mr Cameron may not know it, but we are now on course. Britain is going to make the great escape. It will be an in-out referendum. Is it our time we take back control? Take back control. The capacity of independence. Stronger jobs of the future. Better off. The British people have spoken and the answer is we're out. Brexit means Brexit and we are going to make a success of it. You should be in Brussels negotiating. Yes, been... Get Brexit done. The only way out of that mess is to stop Brexit. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Yeah. Now is the moment to come together and write a new and exciting chapter in our national story. We're going to wave you goodbye. look back at 47 years of membership of the European community. Well, we have three minutes and nine seconds to go until we are no longer members of the EU. Let's bring in our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, who is in Downing Street, and our Europe editor, Katia Adler, who is in Brussels. You have both lived and breathed every twist and turn of this story over the last three years. Katia Adler in Brussels, first of all, the mood tonight in Brussels. Well, here in the European quarter uh, of Brussels, it's always quite quiet at night. Um, there are a couple of lights on in the European Commission behind me. They're going to be working. You know, Brexit just means that it's the end of this era, uh, the UK's partnership inside the European Union. But now, afterwards, there'll be work on a future trade agreement, cooperation on uh, security. Around me, there are mourners of Brexit, people who uh, wish it weren't happening, waving the European European flags, but, but not many really. It's actually quite a, a quiet night here. This is a night that the European Union had hoped that they would never see. Uh, right up until very late in the Brexit process, there were still hopes here uh, that maybe Brexit could be avoided. This is a big night for the EU. No one here thinks that the European Union won't be weaker uh, after the UK leaves. And Laura Koonsberg in Downing Street. I mean, we were talking earlier on about the fact that it is a rather low-key run-up to this departure, imminent departure, but give us a sense of the magnitude of what is about to happen. Oh, Sophie, it's huge. I mean, there's no question about it. It's not often that we can say, look, something is about to happen that genuinely, genuinely will go down in the history books for decades and hundreds of years to come as being a junction for our country, a moment when we took a different road. Something will unplug and unravel our political, our economic, our legal frameworks where our country and the European institutions have become closer and closer and closer for nearly 50 years. And unwinding all of that is, of 
course, not without disruption. But this government, you know, overwhelmingly backed with an 80-seat majority at the general election, believe that they now have the opportunity to show the promise that they have made and the promise that the referendum vote in 2016 held out. They want to show to people as quickly as they can that it was worth it and it was the right thing to do. But with only 30 seconds to go, that question will be hanging for quite some time. And Boris Johnson faces a huge task, not to open English champagne tonight, but to show to voters that they made the right decisions by putting their faith in him and his belief that this was the right choice for all of us. So there's the countdown clock, 25 seconds, 24 until we leave the EU. There are thousands of people waiting around the corner in Parliament Square, waiting to celebrate that moment. For very many people, though, a very different atmosphere tonight. Let's leave it now. Ten seconds to go. have it the recorded sound of Big Ben in Downing Street we are no longer a member of the European Union the scenes there in Parliament Square where the celebrations begin and so begins the next chapter for the United Kingdom we have now formally left the EU after 47 years we are no longer EU citizens let's go straight to Parliament Square now and Vicky Young who is there yeah, and there may have been muted celebrations in Downing Street tonight. That has not been the case here. All evening, speeches from leading Brexiteers, singing, chanting, renditions of God Save the Queen, Royal Britannia. And then, in the final moments before we left the European Union, Nigel Farage, the person many credit with putting pressure on the Conservative Party and making sure that Brexit happened. Tonight, as he addressed the crowds here, he said, some people said this wasn't to be celebrated. He said it was. It was a victory, he said, for democracy. He said, we beat the establishment who didn't want the referendum. They didn't want this to happen. But he also said that this wasn't the end, that there would be battles ahead, and he would be standing by to make sure that Boris Johnson did deliver. When it comes to things like fishing, when it comes to making sure that the uh, European Court of Justice doesn't have a role, he says he will be keeping an eye on what goes on in the next year and absolutely huge cheers here as that moment came well we'll leave the celebrations there in parliament square for now and we are going to go to our island correspondent emma vardy who is on the border the new border between the united kingdom and the european union emma well all of a sudden this invisible geographical line takes on a great new significance. This, where I'm standing, is now the new land border between the UK and the EU. There was no great fanfare, no singing, a small band of protesters gathered here to mark the moment. To the eye, of course, nothing will change, but it will have implications for thousands of businesses across the island. Now, keeping this border open was always such a difficult part of those Brexit negotiations. In the end, a resolution was found through a comp controversial compromise, which effectively moves this border to the Irish Sea. It leaves Northern Ireland in a bit of a halfway house in future, abiding by EU single market rules, but staying part of the new UK's global trading arrangements. And of course, don't forget, it was always so important to people to keep this border open because having an open Irish border has been a fundamental part of the peace process in Northern Ireland after decades of conflict. 
it has been achieved, but people are still far from happy. A majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain. They're still upset. They're being taken out of the EU against their will, whereas others are angry that Northern Ireland is going to have to remain in different arrangements to the rest of the UK. But after all those rows, those battles over British and Irish identity, really now negotiations, <laughs> negotiations over the next 11 months will determine exactly how it's all going to work in practice. Emma Vardy, thank you. Well, Wales voted to leave the EU by virtually the same percentage as the UK as a whole, 52 to 48%. Hal Griffiths is at a rugby club at Taft's Well, just outside Cardiff for us now. And uh, the mood there this evening? Well, a few people raised their glasses here. People obviously thinking about big European battles tomorrow on the pitch as Wales take on Italy. But Wales has been a battleground during the Brexit debate. A majority of people voted here for it. And just in December, the Brexit debate had a real impact on the Welsh political landscape. And joined by two people who were kind of on both either side of that divider, uh, Jane and Chris. Now, Jane, you voted for Brexit, even though you've lived in Spain and in France and think you've got quite an European perspective. We've seen uh, the Brexit clock there. What are your feelings now? Very, very sad. After having lived in both Brittany and Andalusia, the welcome that I had from the people, very, very sad. So why did you vote for Brexit? Economic because I feel that Spain has got one of the highest unemployment with children, etc., teenagers. Italy is in a mess, Greece is in a mess, and I feel even Spain and even France is not out of the woods yet. So you think we're better off out of it, yes. but Chris, that's not your feeling? Yeah, um, as a small business, I feel that um, leaving could, could do us some damage. Um, it's, we don't know how long, how long it's going to last, if we are stay out or if we go back in. Um, so, yeah. And we're told that it could be a trade deal on the way, but you're not that optimistic? No, I believe it when I see it, to be honest with you. OK, thank you both for joining us uh, late tonight at the Rugby Club. There will be plenty of Brexit debates left in Wales, a country which has benefited hugely £5 billion over 20 years from EU funding. No one quite certain yet how the new funding model, the Shared Prosperity Fund, will work. Some, even the First Minister, claiming devolution could be rolled back if that's controlled by, uh, by Whitehall. So I don't think we've heard the end of the Brexit debate here in Wales. Hal Griffith, thank you. Well, let's go to Edinburgh now. Sarah Smith is there and the atmosphere there now defiant I would say Sophie at the moment of 11 o'clock the pretty large crowd hundreds of demonstrators outside the Parliament now were singing Auld Lang Syne and then as the clock struck 11 that was replaced with chants of independence now which gives you a pretty clear idea of what people here what the speakers earlier have been talking about the fight is not over they say they battled for three and a half years to stop scotland being taken out of the eu after it had voted to remain but now the battle moves on for many of the people here for many in the nationalist movement to try and get an independence referendum try and secure independence for scotland and then take that independent country back into the EU. So, I mean, the moment we've left already, the people here are talking about how they want to try and rejoin the EU as an independent Scotland. And that's very much the mood here, that Brexit will fuel independence, these people think and hope, and that's why they're here tonight. Sarah Smith in Edinburgh, thank you. And uh, let's show you Parliament Square again now. And the, uh, the party is continuing there. People singing patriotic songs. Nigel Farage has addressed the crowd and they heard recorded sound of Big Ben at 11 o'clock on the dot. Well, let's talk to our media editor, Amal Rajan, who has been looking at how uh, our exit from the United from the EU is being reported in tomorrow's papers, Amal. Yes, indeed, Sophie. Uh, newspaper hacks live for nights like this. Uh, this is a chance to create a front page splash that lives for the ages and capture the mood of the nation. Uh, it's a big test for editors and their designers. And moreover, it's one that, unlike with election nights, have actually had time to plan for. Let's have a look at the first one. Here's a bit of a surprise. This is the Daily Mail, which has been absolutely central to shaping the national conversation over Brexit. It had a very Brexity front page this morning, a uh, celebration of uh, Brexit Day, but it's actually left Brexit it off the front page altogether and it's leading with the coronavirus. Let's move on to the next one. This is, um, I think this is the sun that we've got next. Let's have a look at this. Uh, make leave, not war. Um, is this 
led on uh, Boris Johnson's message for tonight, which is a sort of optimistic and positive one. And we'll rattle through the rest of them. This is the Express newspaper, which is uh, leading with a metaphor of a new dawn. Um, uh, one that another paper leads with as well, um, uh, and a picture of some waving flags, which is a common theme. Then we move on to the I, a non-partisan paper, which asks the question of where we are going next, uh, with another picture of the uh, uh, interesting events outside Parliament Square. The Daily Mirror also has a new dawn. The Daily Mirror, which uh, was against Brexit, though many of its readers uh, actually supported it, says now build the Britain we were promised. The Daily Telegraph, which has been very supportive of jo Boris Johnson, leads with more flags, says Johnson ramps up the pressure on the EU. The Scotsman says Sturgeon's fresh appeal for patients in the battle for Indy Ref 2. Uh, and the next paper is The Guardian, which leads with um, uh, an essayistic look uh, at events from Jonathan Freeland. I think we've got that there. Um, and I think it's fair to say many of the papers have led with an optimistic me message, even if they opposed it. Um, FT leads with Britain finally cuts EU ties. They uh, tend to play these events straight. Let's roll on and see the next one. This is, I think, The Guardian. Uh, should be there. Yes, the day we say goodbye, this is an essay from Jonathan Freeland. Uh, a reflective essay rather than uh, a news story. And I think the final one is The Times, which uh, has a picture of uh, a, a car outside Parliament uh, waving a flag and farewell to EU. I think it's fair to say, Sophie, it's a big test of newspapers and uh, some of them passed with flying colours, literally. Amal, thank you. Well, let's go to uh, Downing Street now and talk to our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, who is there for us. And, Laura, that is the big question, isn't it? What is next? What comes now? Well, what comes next, first of all, is a long, long period of hard bargaining between the UK and the EU. The UK government determined to try to get a free trade deal done by the end of this year, but that will not be straightforward, not least because there are so many things that have to be sorted out, but also because the EU will drive a hard bargain. Yes, both sides say, of course, we want to still be friends and partners, we want to be respectful neighbours and people want to do lots of business with each other, but the UK government has already acknowledged that that will mean some friction to use the technical terms and also until it's all done and dusted it means still uncertainty for businesses and people around the country who want to know exactly what is next but although there is legions of details to be worked out many more political controversies along the way be in no doubt the fundamental question which has been hanging over this place and hanging over the country for more than three years has been settled and that's already completely changed the political dynamic and therefore the dynamic in the country too. And Katia Adler in, in Brussels, we've heard a lot of warm words from the EU over the past few days, but in terms of negotiations from now on, 